we know now for sure that people who tell us about the inner death experience, it must have happened during a period that the brain didn't function at all. Uh, there was a very interesting story in the book about the man with dentures. Yes. So you can prove that this indeed happened during a period of cardiac arrest. But people have this kind of experiences. First of all, they think they're crazy. It doesn't fit in our current materialist worldview. How have you changed as a result of this inquiry, Pim? In Europe, there must have been 125 million people who have an after-death communication. And in the United States, about 100 million people know that people with a cardiac arrest have no brain function at all left. In retrospective studies, and most people thought it was just an oxy of the brain, neurotransmitters in the brain, hallucinations, dreams. You would have no fear of death, right? No, no, I'm not. I'm curious. I, it's not the same as people with an near-death experience. They are 100% sure. Mm. I think I'm 98% or 99 But the brain stop, uh, function stops. There should be no consciousness, let alone an enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception out and above the body, with emotions, with cognition, with memories from early childhood, etc. Dr. Pim van Lommel, thank you so much for joining me. I feel really lucky to have the opportunity to speak with you. You're welcome. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Um, what drew you, can you tell me a little bit about your origin story and what drew you to cardiology? Why choose that field? Well, when I was on school, I was doubting between a study of physics and a study of healthcare, of medicine. And then at last I took medicine and then I took cardiology with a lot of physics in it as well. So I'm what we call a beta. <laughs> and uh, that's how it started. And I, I loved my study and I love being a cardiologist as well. But, um, uh, yeah. And so you would have studied in the late, we say late 60s? 60s. Late 60s, yeah. So medicine has come a significant way since that time, right? You it's were incredible. Uh, you, 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 when you, I studied uh, uh, medicine, the cardiology was just about congenital heart disease and valve disease. And that's yeah. it. And in, in 69, it was the first coronary care catheterization. And, uh, and in 71, was the first bypass surgery in Holland. And I was working in the first hospital who were doing this cath lab and, and, and uh, heart surgery as well. That's um, that, that's amazing. So you've seen medicine almost like go for the study of, of cardiology, go from almost the embryonic stage to what we yes. know now, which is massive. Yes, I'm very grateful for it. But, so but when I just, as a young doctor started in my specialization, I just work, was working one of the first current care units in the Netherlands, because of the modern techniques of resuscitation, which is the um, defibrillation and external chest compression, were just available. Mm. And until 1967, all patients with a cardiac arrest died. So it was all new, coronary care units as well. And it was when I started, especially there was one medication available, and that's it. But when you got coronary care um, and then uh, heart catheterization with a coronary angiogram and then bypass surgery and then later PTCA and stents at uh, pacemakers and ICDs and a lot of medication etc rhythm di 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 diagnostics etc so it was I have just seen the start of cardiology until what it is now it's incredible um I've heard you say science is asking questions with an open mind and that's you it <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that the scientific community can be dogmatic, rigid, or even inflexible? It is. Still now, quite a lot of scientists have been raised in the materialist science, and, and they're just fixed in this dogma that everything can be explained by just when you can objectify something and can measure something, when you can duplicate something, or when you can falsify also something then it is true uh so all the facts must be objective measurement measurable but then the problem comes with consciousness 
So what you think and what you feel, you cannot objectify, you cannot measure, you cannot duplicate, you cannot falsify. So then they have a huge problem. And that's why they just tell us consciousness is just an illusion. It's just the brain what you're looking at. And consciousness does not exist, exist at all. And that's still the majority of neuroscientists and also even philosophers or psychologists still have this idea. And uh, so we have to change uh, science as well. And that's what you said. Science is asking questions with an open mind. I forget what you've learned. Forget the concept you've learned because otherwise you will miss new facts and new ideas. Do you think there's an element of protectionism? It's, I... it's fear. Yeah. It's fear. I think when, when you have always told and, and written articles and doing research uh, where to find consciousness somewhere in the brain and you seem to be wrong, then you lose your, your, your research money, you re lose your position in university. I know some professors have lo lost their position in universities because they had the different ideas. So um, they're frightened. And I know some professors who do privately tell me, you could be right, but officially they say this is total nonsense until they retire. And then they said, I could have been wrong my whole life. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, you began researching NDEs in 1986, but you had an experience in the yeah. late 60s. Can you yes. tell us about that experience? Yeah, that was what happened in the, in the first coronary care unit in, um, in the Netherlands. So we resuscitated a man of 44 years old who had a cardiac arrest due to acute myocardial infarction. And we had... I think three or four times defibrillation, and he regained consciousness after about four minutes. And we were so happy as a resuscitation team. I was the doctor in charge. I mean, it was all new for us. And the patient regained consciousness. He was alive again. But the patient was very, very disappointed and told us about going through a tunnel, talking about the light and beautiful landscape, beautiful music. I always tell some uh, people, I've never forgotten this event, but I didn't do anything with it. I just started my specialization as a young family with two small children. So I never forgot it, but I didn't do anything with it. Until in 1986, I read a book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow. And George Ritchie uh, had a near-death experience in 1943 as a medical student. He had a double pneumonia and he died because there were no antibiotics available for this medical student. And his body was covered with a sheet and the nurse was so upset that this medical student had died that she was able to persuade the doctor to give him an injection with adrenaline right into his heart, which was totally uncommon. But he, he regained consciousness. He was, after a period of nine minutes, he regained consciousness and was back again in his body. And he had a very deep, a very extensive near death experience, very impressive. I always advise people to read this book. You can read it in one evening. It's so an impressive story. And that's why my interest and curiosity started to grow after reading this book. Yeah. So because of reading this book, I got it from a friend, good friend of mine. I just started to interview patients, ask patients who had survived a cardiac arrest in the past, if they could have memory from the period of a consciousness. And within two years, from 86 to 88, asking 50 patients who survived cardiac arrest, and 12 of them shared the NDE with me. And that started my scientific curiosity, because I've always learned in university medical school that it is impossible to have memories from the period of unconscious. When the heart stops during cardiac arrest, there's no circulation, no breathing, you're in coma, uh, you're, you're, you're dying, then it should be impossible, because the, until now never proven hypothesis that consciousness brought a brain function, then it should be impossible because when the brain stop, uh, function stops, there should be no consciousness, let alone an enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception out and above the body with emotions, with cognition, with memories from early childhood, etc. And there have been four studies done with the fire of cardiac arrest. Uh, our study is still the largest one, the only one with statistical, statistical analysis. We have seen that 44 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in the Dutch study. And there was a study in USA by Bruce Grayson and two studies in the UK, one by 
some party be the fatic on one by pedic sartori and a total of 562 patients who survived cardiac arrest mm. and what we found out that there was no medical explanation at all to explain the cause and content of an NDE. so we could exclude anoxia of turbine as an explanation for the cause and content of the NDE because all patients also in our study had been unconscious because of lack of oxygen in the brain and only 18 percent reported an NDE. Mm-hmm. and when we compared the 18 percent of patients with an NDE with the 82 percent without an NDE, all survived cardiac arrest there was no difference at all in the duration of cardiac arrest two minutes or eight minutes did it matter at all uh, the period of unconsciousness, five minutes or three weeks in coma, it didn't matter at all. Complicated CPR by the need of intubation, a lot of medication, didn't matter at all. We had 30 patients in the cath lab with electrophysiological studies, and they all resuscitated within 30 seconds, didn't matter at all. So the severity of anoxia of the brain didn't matter at all to explain uh, the cause of NDE. And until that time, there were just retrospective studies, and most people thought it was just an oxy of the brain, neurotransmitters in the brain, hallucinations, dreams, whatever, false memories. So we could explain all the other explanations as well. So we could exclude psychological explanations like the fear of death. We could exclude use of medication, whatever they got. It didn't matter at all. They, we could exclude gender, religion, if they would people who are atheists of, of Christian or Muslim didn't matter at all. Education didn't matter at all. Foreknowledge, as you know that these experiences are possible, didn't matter at all. So the main conclusion of our study was there was no medical scientific explanation why people have a near-death experience in cardiac arrest. That's the first thing. The second aspect is that we know that people with a cardiac arrest have no brain function at all left. So there have been studies on induced cardiac arrest in, 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 in humans, let's say for threshold testing in ICDs. So you induce a cardiac arrest, you test the ICD to find a good threshold. We also have done these studies in animals. What we see in those studies that when you have cardiac arrest, you lose consciousness within seconds. The blood flow to the brain, that you can measure here in the carotid artery, is zero mm-hmm. within one second. The, the body reflexes are gone with the function of the cortex of the brain. The brain stem reflexes are gone. So the, the, the gag reflex, you put a finger in someone's throat without any problem. The corneal reflex, the, there are fixed dilated pupils who do not, do not react on, on light. There's no breathing anymore. The brain center is close to the brain stem. And when there are studies, and there have been studies done with the registration of the electric activity of the cortex of the brain, the EEG, the EG always flatlines within 10 to 20 seconds. So we have proven that there is no brain function left after 20 seconds after cardiac arrest. And there is no patient ever been successfully resuscitated within 20 seconds. It always takes several minutes, even in the coronary care unit, to get people back. So we know now for sure that people who tell us about the inner death experience it must have happened to the period that the brain didn't function at all. And that's the main conclusion. And then there are also aspects of the, uh, and the like the out of body experience that, that people can have critical perceptions from a position out and above the body, which can be corroborated by doctors, nurses, and family members. And, and so you can prove that this and he happened during the period of cardiac arrest, because you can also have see at what moment of the CPR of surgery the, the outer body experience happened. And there have been now two books uh, with more than 200 cases of corroborated theoretical perception during outer body experiences. And it seems that 98% of those corroborated theoretical perceptions were totally true. It really, what it told us, happened during CPR, during cardiac arrest, during surgery or during coma. So it proves that it is not an hallucination, nor an delusion, not an illusion. It is really happening, but the brain does not function. Um, at what point, according to the to your book, I think you you intimated that at five minutes, severe brain damage 
when somebody is, is going through experienced cardiac, cardiac arrest and is clinically dead, severe brain damage starts to take place. Well, right. after about five to 10 minutes. So you have to initiate CPR as yeah. soon as possible because the first five to 10 minutes, the, the uh, loss of function of, of the brain is still reversible. That's why we call it clinical death. Mm. Clinical death is a period of unconsciousness caused by lack of circulation and breathing, and it's still reversible. But when you're too late, then there is irreversible damage to the brain and people will always die. So clinical death is the, the first stage of the process of dying. And we know from people who have a cardiac arrest outside the hospital, so out of hospital arrest, where you're not always as soon available, so you have a, a, a CPR, the mortality rate is more than 90%. Because you're too late. Yeah. You had a, there was a very interesting story in the book about the man with dentures. Yes. <laughs> can you, can you tell us that story again? Yeah, yeah. It was also published in our, so our study was published in the Lancet in 2001. And our study had two parts. That was the prospective study and the, and the longitudinal study. We'll come back later to the longitudinal study. But the out of body experience of this man was very impressive. He was found in coma in a meadow about 30 minutes before he was brought into a hospital and people just found him and did some primitive CPR. When he was brought into the current care unit, his body was already cold, was blue, there was no circulation, no breathing, no body reflexes, no brain cell reflexes. His pupils didn't react to light. So the nurse was were quite upset with this long, young man who seemed to be die, dead. And the first thing he did was to start intubation to give him more oxygen. And when he tried to intubate the patient, he found out that this patient had a dentist in his mouth. So he took out his dentist and put them somewhere on the crash car. And it took one and a half hour before they had adequate circulation and heart rhythm back. But he was still in coma still needed artificial respiration. And so he was transferred to the intensive care unit to continue the artificial respiration, uh, respiration for one week until he regained consciousness. And then he was brought back to the cardiac ward. And he was just there when a nurse came in for medication. He saw the nurse, he said, you know where my dentists are. And this was flabbergasted. And he said, yeah, you were there when I was brought into a hospital. And you took my dentist out of my, you took it, put it somewhere on the, there was a car with all those bottles on it, there was a sliding somewhere underneath, and there you put my dentures. And he could ex, uh, explain everybody is uh, how they looked like, the doctors and nurses. He could describe from above the resuscitation room where he was brought into coma and was left in coma. So he could describe everything into detail while there was in deep coma and during the period of CPR. And this is what we call corroboration of theoretical perception. The nurse knew exactly what had happened and then and the patient told him. And the, the extraordinary thing about the story as well is that he was clinically dead for an extended period of time. I mean, you mentioned the, upwards of 30 minutes at least. Yeah. He should not have recovered. Did he make a full recovery? Yeah. He made but a full recovery. It was, it was cold weather. Perhaps that could be a, a possibility. And yeah. it took one and a half minutes CPR to get him back. But he was young, so the people were just trying yeah. to give all the energy to get him back. He, he was he was he was lucky that he came back. Can you think of any other possible explanation as to how he may have? Is there anything else that, that occurred to you? Any rational, well, materialistic possibility of how I he would have known about I was raised as a materialist scientist, materialist cardiologist. So mm. before I could believe that this was possible, it took some time as well. So it took several years after starting our study before I was changing my mind. And now I'm convinced that the brain does not produce consciousness, but the brain has a facilitating function, not a producing function to experience consciousness. I've heard um, both yourself and other commentators and, and people who are studying NDEs say that the brain is a filter as opposed to a generator of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. A transceiver or a filter 
or what you can call it also an interface. Mm. And, and, and to, to understand this function of the brain is almost like to compare it with the internet. Um, there now at this moment, one billion websites and YouTube films go through your room, through your body. Some are always everywhere in the world, but you need a functioning computer to receive a part of this cloud. You need several codes to get several websites of YouTube films. And, but the websites are always there. And you need a functioning computer. And so you need a functioning brain to receive parts of this enhanced, or what I call non-local consciousness, to receive into your body and brain as a waking consciousness. And it's just a part of this memories as well. Because when you're out of your body, that's what we hear from patients with a death experience. Uh, you have all memories from early childhood. You're connected with other people as well. You have some type of future events as well. So you are in a realm where there is no time, no space. Everything is connected. And that's why we call it non-local consciousness. Everything is always connected without time, without space. So when they have a live review during a cardiac rest for five minutes, they can, they can talk for weeks because everything happens at the same moment. When you think of somebody you will meet it. But when you think of a place, you will be there, always at the same moment. So it's a total different kind of consciousness as we have now, so as we're sitting here in our waking consciousness. Um, the accepted scientific, the materialist scientific explanation is around what you mentioned was anoxia, right? So oxygen deprivation. You're not, you refute that argument completely, right? For NDEs. Yes, I think we, we could prove in the four prospect studies in survival cardiac arrest that we know that during a period of a non-functioning brain, a percentage between 15 and 20% of those patients reported in the classical near death experience with all the universal elements that are possible. And this should be impossible. We should not expect people to have any memory at all because the brain function has ceased. So it's what we call the paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception. And all the centers in the brain who are important for this kind of experience, also for memories, do not function at all during the period of cardiac arrest. Um, in your study, you, you compared how people changed after yeah. cardiac arrest, those who had an ND and those who didn't. And the findings were, were fascinating and... Quite moving, actually. What were your? Can you yeah, that, that was our longitudinal study. So we, we made a, a taped interview with all pa patients with an Eddie who were still alive after two years and eight years, with a mass control group of patients who survived cardiac arrest without an Eddie. Mass control means the same gender, same the same age, and the same time interval. What we found when you compare the two groups with and without an NDE there was a statistical difference between patients with a near-death experience and without an ND in their transformation. The classical transformation is no fear of death anymore. They have a new insight of what is important in life. It's about unconditional love, compassion, empathy, first towards yourself, accept your own negative aspects we all have, and then have unconditional love empathy, compassion towards others, towards nature, towards animals, towards plants, towards planet Earth, because you feel still feel connected with everybody, with everything. And you know now that it's all about giving love to others. Uh, it's not about power. It's not about money. It's not about a beautiful body, not about clothes. It's about treating others as you would love to be treated yourself. It's the classical comparison we know and the third thing is that people have the enhanced uh, intuitive sensitivity which is that they know what other people think and feel and they say they have new they know future events they know when someone is ill they know that someone will die in three weeks and they will die and it is very difficult for those people who have this kind of information you don't want to have you think of somebody and the phone call will and he's calling you so there's an, what we call scientifically a non-local information exchange. 
you receive information not by your senses and not by your body beyond time and beyond space. You receive future events, you have see things on a distance, you know what, what people think and feel. And that's quite disturbing as well. The other thing what we found is that when people have this kind of experiences, first of all, they think they're crazy. It doesn't fit in our current materialist worldview. And when they try to talk about it, nobody will believe it. Doctors won't believe it. Nurses are a little bit better. But also family members and partner don't believe you. So they keep silent. I've met patients with an Andy who have been silent for 50 years because they could not talk about it. And then it is a period of depression, homesickness, and loneliness. So it, it's a spiritual trauma for years, despite the positive content of the ending. And as soon as they see a film on television or they read a book or they talk, or hear someone talk about an death experience, then they, then they know I'm not the only one. Um, it's called an NDE, and then they start to share it with others, and then they can start to accept it, and later to start to integrate it into their daily life, and they change the way they live. And it can take 20, 30, 40 years. So it's hard work, despite the positive content of the NDE. Yeah, um, but ultimately it is a a, a significant life-changing experience. Oh, yes, it is. It's incredible. Quite, it's quite incredible. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson spoke about NDEs, and he made the the point that you're very often you're relying on subjective eyewitness testimony, and the, we know from eyewitness testimony that it can be falsified or it can be flawed, and we 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 see this all the time in in courtrooms. Chillingly enough, what's your perspective on eyewitness testimony as the main arbiter? of yeah. evidence well what i told you before there you can corroborate theoretical perceptions that people have had and what they told us as subjective experience happens to be true in reality so uh, what they could perceive from a position out and above the body really happened at the moment of the coma of cardiac arrest of surgery they can meet deceased relatives, even if they don't know that they were dead as well. Uh, so it's also an objective aspect. So you can see some of the future events. I know people have written down what they have seen in the uh, and the future events, and they can later, well, skip it off because it happened years later as well. So there are some objective facts that you cannot deny at all. Um, and there has been a study done uh, about the quality of memories and patients with a near-death experience that was done in Belgium. I mean, you compare the, the quality of memories from patients with an NDE with memory from things happened in daily life. The quality of memories with an NDE is much, much more severe and strongly. And when you talk to patients, and the NDE had happened 50 years before, they talk about it with the same emotion as it happened yesterday. It's totally different from normal memories. Um, what is the um, the problem um, with the brain as a computer analogy comparison? Is there a problem? Well, for me, there's no problem. But the problem is that material scientists who still believe the never proven hypothesis that the brain produces consciousness. Mm. But then all these these experiences should be impossible. So when the brain doesn't function, and you still have this enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception out above the, the, the lifeless body, with cognition, emotions, with memories from early childhood, etc., that should be impossible. So uh, but here science scientists have to change their mind, but they're it's hard for them because they're 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 frightened that they still have a wrong worldview at all in the world. Neuroscientists um, and neurosurgeons would say that the likely location of consciousness is the cerebral cortex. What would be your perspective? Am I, am I right in, in making that assertion? Well, 
as I told you before, the brain doesn't function at all. There is no part of the brain mm. which is active. There's a flatline EEG, which is the activity of, of the cortex of the brain. And to have our waking conscious as we have it now, according to modern neuroscience, you have many neural centers in the cortex who coordinate information and exchange information with each other. It's called the global neural workspace. And it's not at all available to a cardiac arrest. So it, it's according to our current uh, neuroscience, it should be impossible to have any memory at all. What's now, the role of DNA in consciousness? Maybe we don't know. Uh, it, it, let's say, I think, personally, and I've written about it in my book as well, Yeah. that... Uh, it's not just the brain functions as an interface, but I think the whole body functions as an interface. Uh, so different aspects of consciousness have different in, different interfaces. So each organ in each cell has an interface function. And my idea is that DNA could be the interface in each cell. And, and we, because what we know, that when there is the first when an egg cell and the spermatozoa comes together after four cell divisions, the cells are changing into heart cells, brain cells, uh, um, whatever, different kinds of eye cells, etc. They differ, but the structure of DNA in each cell is the same. But the function of the DNA changes because of information from outside. It's we also know from the epigenetics. So information from outside can change the function of the brain. Not the structure, but the function of the brain. So genes go off and on. And, and we also know that um, after um, organ transplantation, even let's say a heart and lung transplant, people sometimes have changes in their character and we don't know who the donor is, but in the United States, after five years, you, you can ask who the donor was and changes in, in, in the character fits quite well with the character of the deceased donor who gave organs. So the, the, the when you receive an organ, it's still a living organ. Let's say a donor is not dead at all, it's brain death, but 97% of the body is still alive, is kept alive. And yeah, Eat a functioning organ for transplant, not a dead organ. Uh, so the, this transplanted organ still functions as a kind of receiver of interface for parts of the consciousness of the deceased donor as well. It's also another aspect. So I personally believe that DNA, especially what we call the junk DNA, uh, could be the, an interface for aspects of consciousness. Um, and in the book, Consciousness Beyond Life, you do talk about, and you re refer to the memory and personality transplants, yeah. which are almost inconceivable and, yeah. and very difficult to understand um, how that physical material transplant could be, could be influencing personality. Is there any studies that you can think of, or have we... Has there been scientific research into that? Well, there have been studies done. Um, I refer to it in my book as well. There have been 10 young patients who had a heart transplant who mm. changed. And if one of the heart transplants could tell about the murder of the, the organ donor. And uh, there's a book, Change of Heart, uh, published. And it has been well researched, but there is no prospective scientific study done. We tried to do it in Europe or in Holland, but transplant centers do not want to cooperate on this subject. They refuse it. Wow. And, um, and even also, we don't know in Europe who the donor is, also not after five or ten years. It's only in the United States that it's possible to know it. Um, what in, in, in terms of the future of the field of, of research for near-death experiences, what is left to uncover? I mean, there's a significant amount, of course, but where do you think pe researchers should be directing their efforts? 
I think we have change side to change science. We have to include subjective experience in science, what we call the post-materialist science. We have to accept subjective experiences as a scientific tool. We have to believe what people tell us. We have to, because what you are, the essence, essence of who you are is what you think or what you feel. And we know now, because of the, all these prospective studies, that this this essence of who you are, consciousness, is eternal. There's no beginning, will there, there will never there will never be an end to consciousness. So for me, the main thing is not have more research, but to spread the word about it. Let's say um, giving interviews like I'm doing now reading books, um, Zoom interviews, uh, articles, uh, also my website are many scientific articles, just peer reviews, journals, uh, the published articles. And people have to know about it. I think the general population knows much more about this kind of research than the most materialist scientists. They have an opinion, which is usually prejudice and willful ignorance, because they don't know the literature as well. So for me, the most important thing is that people will read about this research and think about it. And, um, and the change will come from the general population. Let's say another aspect, let's say post, the after-death communication, that people have the, the idea that they are in contact with the concept of deceased relatives in the first days, weeks, or months after the death of a relative. In Europe, there must have been 125 million people who have an after-death communication. And in the United States, about 100 million people. Which means, when you have been in contact with the conscious of disease relatives, you can see them, you can communicate with them, you get sometimes information that should be impossible to know. You can feel them, you can smell them, etc. That prove that the consciousness of a disease relative is still somewhere in the non-local realm. And when I give a lecture, which is mostly sold out in the Netherlands as well, 30 to 40% of the people who are attending my lecture, when I ask about it, have had the after-death communication. And that's why they're sitting there to know more. Because we, when this seems to be possible to be in contact with the concept of disease relative, that means, that proves that consciousness is still there. It's eternal. So we have to talk about it. And people with an after-death communication are also mostly silent about it. People with a near-death experience are always silent about it because nobody will believe them. So the main thing is, um, when there are 25 million people in Europe and 20, 15 million people in the USA with a near-death near experience, always ask them, please share it with others. Share it with your doctor. Talk about it with family members. So 70% of people with NDE are divorced because the partner said it's not the same person as before when we were married. So when you change a lot, it's not easy at all, but please share it with others so we can change our ideas about the mind-brain relationship. Uh, do you think that uh, AI and emerging technologies could be useful would they add to the field of study in any in any meaningful capacity? I don't think so. I, I think that there have been this a vast study still trying to give some EG registration dual CPR, but it's very hard to do it. And it's it's an incomplete EEG, and you start only after five minutes or later because before you are come with EEG to the patients in CPR. So um I think we had enough studies done. I mean, have also studies done in induced cardiac arrest, also in animals. In animals, also the deeper structures of the brain stop functioning after five to ten, uh, uh, 10 to 20 seconds as well. So we know the brain stop function stops. We know that people can have conscious experience with enhanced consciousness and memories and possibility of perception. So what we need to do is talk about it, tell about it, write about it, give interviews about it. And I think that will help. But, but uh, for neuroscientists, it's it's really a hard prob problem uh, because they lose the position in university and lose their research money. So I I understand that they are very reluctant to be open. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can understand from a scientific perspective the, the, the issues as well that they have trying to acquire empirical evidence. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the, the challenge that they face. Um, but your perspective is that you've got to include subjective experience and you've got to start including it. Um, well, what we did is an empirical study. Mm. So uh, our study was uh, published in The Lancet because the empirical study was well done and the statistics were well done. So it was a well done study in scientific point of view. And that's why they published it. Even an editorial board had some problems with it because of the subject of NDE. But the methodology was well done as now. So we had statistical analysis with empirical studies done. So we don't need more. For me, we don't need any more. When you have 562 patients who survived cardiac arrest and studies, I don't know if you will add information, we have 1,000 study, uh, patients or so. But what's interesting now that a Spanish group is now starting to reproduce our study in Spanish-speaking countries. So we have now already 10 hospitals in Spain, Mexico, and South, Middle, South America, where they start to reproduce our study with the prospective and uh, longitudinal aspects as well. It will take another 10 to 12 years. But it's very interesting. And uh, we hope to have results within several years. We have to wait. Uh, but I'm convinced that we, they will have the same results as we had. How how have you changed as a result of this inquiry, Pim? Yeah, well, I was as I told, I was a material scientist, uh, convinced that the brain was producing consciousness, and now I'm convinced that there is a non-local consciousness beyond the brain, and that we have to change the way we live because I'm now convinced also that we are connected with each other and with nature. So we have to think about the environment. We have to think about the future of the planet Earth where our children, grandchildren have to live and survive. So we have to change the way we live. My wife and I are vegetarian for more than 25 years now. We love to be outside each Day. We try to be at least one hour in nature, walking or biking. Uh, we love our garden. In our house, it's always silent. No music at all, no, as, except when we start to listen to music. But it's always silent as well. So um, we're relaxed. We're happy. We're grateful for our life. We have two children, five grandchildren who are happy as well. So it's a good life. Grateful. I'm 80, nearly 82, uh, 81 years old now. and I'm still active biking, walking each day. And you would have no fear of death, right? No, no, I'm not. I'm curious. I, it's not the same as people with a near-death experience. They are 100% sure. Mm. I think I'm 98% or 99% sure. And and I think the process of dying is not easy at all. It's hard mm. work. But death is a relief. Death is something else. You did say in the book, Consciousness Beyond Life, that... Um, a small percentage of NDEs, NDEers, found the experience traumatizing and awful. Yes, distressing NDEs. We don't know the exact number, perhaps one or two percent. Mm. Even patients who have a distressing NDE or hellish experience are more reluctant even to talk about it without it because they have a feeling of guilt as well. So uh, perhaps one or two percent of those patients have a one or two percent distressing fears and and they come in let's say when you have a positive near-death experience about 50 percent of those patients come in a dark space dark room it can be frightening and then they see a small light they're attracted to it they call, call it the tunnel but perhaps one or two percent stay in this dark room of going down in a kind of hellish experience also george ritchie was in this down uh, uh, realm somewhere um, it's like a little bit like uh, the divine comedy of Dante. People can experience as well. Um, I call it an incomplete uh, NDE because they don't go to the light, come back. And there have been uh, articles published about it and also a book published about it. They are not bad people. Um, but they experience a distressing experience as well. And um, you should remember and realize that well, when you experience your what we call your reality around you, 
the world you see is depending on your state of consciousness. Where you are love, it's a beautiful world, and where you're depressed, it's an awful world, but it's still the same world. So mm -hmm. when you are an aspect of fear, you can have a experience of fear during the, the NDE. But it doesn't say anything about the person you are. You also made the point that the mind can change brain functioning, right? And we know this, yes. and this has been demonstrably proven to be true because, I mean, through meditation, through neuroplasticity. Can I ask you about that again? Oh, of course. Um, but the neuroplasticity is very important. When you young children, there's hundreds of thousands of, of connections are being made each day in the brain of a, of a small child. Um, but when you change your consciousness, then you change the function of the brain. And we know it from placebo effect. When you have severe depression of a lot of pain of Parkinson disease, and you get a placebo treatment, you see in the brain the same improvement than you see when you have a real treatment. So when you believe you're treated well, then your brain changes as well, and you have less complaints as well. So Parkinson's patients can move better. Depression is less, pain is less, etc. And we know it for meditation. When you have a long-term meditator, you have far more gamma waves in your brain. But also when you or I start to, to meditate for six weeks, then already your brain function changes as well. Um, we have been have done studies in, in taxi drivers in London who have to know the London roads by heart and a little hard work. And then you saw parts of the brain who became more hypertrophic, the part of the brain where you where you put your memories in. Uh, so you see that uh, the brain changes when you see, look. Uh, a virus or a, so someone who plays piano parts of the brain are more structures than others because you have a functional increase in, in, in brain function locally as well so the brain reacts to changes in their consciousness um I noticed when reading the book that there was, you did go through all the major religions, but there was no mention of a creator or God. And you, were, I, I felt you were deliberately staying away from that question. Um, maybe perhaps I can ask you about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, I have never read the Bible at home as a young child. My father was atheist. He was a neurologist as well. And my mother was interested, but we didn't have, perhaps we had a Bible somewhere, we have a, but after I had talked to people with an NDA, I started to read the Bible. I started, especially the New Testament. I write to read about Tibetan Buddhism, about the Vedas and the Upanishads, the Hindus, about the Kabbalah, about Hinduism, about Judaism, about anthroposophy, etc. And all these main world religions and also when you see in indigenous people as well there's no end to consciousness they always say that and plato has said this 2500 years ago he described a classical near-death experience in the soul of the earth and he also writes that the body is just a temporary carrier of the eternal soul so it has been known in all times and all religions and I think there's something beyond comprehensive, and people call it God. I call it the defined consciousness of, of enhanced consciousness of non local consciousness. It's, it's beyond comprehension. And everything starts from this consciousness, which for me is fundamental in the universe. So everything starts with consciousness together with energy and information. And everything, what we see in our physical world, is a product of consciousness. Our body is also a product of consciousness. Everything is a product of consciousness. So it's primary, it's fundamental. And a lot of uh, very uh, Nobel Prize winners have said it as well. I quoted in my book as well, in my article. Yeah, you, you do. There's a chapter on quantum physics, um, and you do go into some depth there, um, which I have to confess, it was slightly above my pay grade. 
Um, but um, it was a fascinating chapter. Um, what I what, what I was thinking as I was reading it is some of the ideas and hypotheses proposed by quantum mechanics are so outlandish that compared to consciousness surviving death, that they, I mean, that's just a, a tiny, um, it, it's of no comparison, Lawrence Krauss wrote the universe from, from nothing. I mean, if if consciousness is everywhere, then everything is on the table. That that would be my my only concern. Quantum mechanics is just an analogy, and not an explanation for consciousness. The analogy mm. is that everything is always connected, instantaneously, without beginning, without end, and beyond time, beyond space. That's the analogy with quantum physics. But this has been proven with the double split, uh, etc. So that's something. And the other thing is, it, which is intriguing, that in quantum physics, consciousness seems to play a role. There's no objective observer. So the, the idea of the, uh, the, the scientist who makes an experiment makes by this same moment the result of the experiment. So you can prove the double split experiment that light behaves as waves, and you can prove that light behaves as particles. Both is true, but it should not be possible at all. But depends on the consciousness of the designer of the experiment, which makes the result. So consciousness is essential also. We are just part of the experiment, and there's no objective observer at all. Consciousness must be fundamental. And I know that when you have the possibility to see future events during the death experience, but also people can have prognostic dreams mm. about some very special event. And then years later, this happens, a funeral, marriage, or the, the déjà vu feeling when you come somewhere in a, in, in a foreign country, you say, I've been here before. That means that future events are also available. Uh, that means... When there is free will, and people with the enhanced sensitivity sensitivity see that someone will die in six months, and he dies in six months, somewhere in higher dimension must be fixed this moment of, of death. But during life here on planet Earth, we have to free will. When the, our life should be from A to B, we will enter B, but we can take all the wrong directions during our life, that's the free will, but we eventually will end at B, independent of what we try to do. What does the future hold for Dr. Pim Van Lamo? For? For me. Mm. <laughs> I hope to be a little bit healthy for the next years, and so the, what I'm doing now, I'm still receiving many, many emails each day, I'm giving interviews, I'm giving lectures all over the world, uh, so I'm trying to share my ideas with others as well. I think that's important. Until I'm not here anymore, and then you can still read my books and see my interviews. Yes. Dr. <laughs> Pip Van Laman, thank you so much. It's been a real privilege. I feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to talk to you. You're welcome.